Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. So a very good morning to you and you're welcome to today's Signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe and well uh, wherever you're joining us from today. This series is brought to you by Chagas Connected in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, uh, the Nas uh, National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we'll be celebrating World Bee Day with a talk uh, on biodiversity on farmland by Dr. Catherine Keena, who is Countryside Management Specialist with Chagas. Good morning, Catherine. You're very welcome to today's webinar. Morning, Mark. So today we had hoped to have uh, Ruth Wilson, who is a farmland officer with uh, the All-Ireland Pollinator uh, Plan. But unfortunately, Ruth uh, is unwell today. So Catherine, you're very kind to have stepped into the breach, but you are also involved in the, uh, uh, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. Is that right? Yes, I've been involved with um, Una Fitzpatrick and Jane South from the beginning, well, me on the steering group, they're, they're leading it. Um, but today I'm going to uh, give a kind of a more general talk about biodiversity. It's also Biodiversity Week, and uh, we look forward to having Ruth uh, talking more specifically about the farmland actions at, a, at, a, at another stage. Great, great. And Pat, good morning to you. You're going to help us out questions later on. Um, yep. So just a reminder to everybody, and maybe Catherine, you could you could start sharing your screen with us. Um, and uh, you can send us your questions to using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on the Chagas uh, YouTube channel, along with Catherine's presentation. Catherine, we'll hand over to you and um, we shall talk to you afterwards. So today is World Bee Day, and it is an opportunity to promote bees. And um, from, in, from the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, we have a few interesting facts there. 100 crops provide 90% of the world's food, and 71 of those are pollinated by bees. Um, pollination is estimated to be worth 53 million to the Irish economy. And of course, the bees then represent the, the wider biodiversity and the landscape, which again, I'll focus a, little, a wee bit more on today. So the outline of my talk is going to be what is biodiversity, why it's important, the decline in biodiversity. We shall talk about plants growing wild, uh, which are part of our native Irish biodiversity. And I shall finish with three messages for biodiversity and World Bee Day. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the flora, the fauna and the habitats in which they exist. So our flora, as you can see from the pictures, includes the trees, the flowers, the, the mosses, the lichens, the fungi. The fauna include the birds, the bats, the bees, the mammals, the amphibians, the, the fish and the invertebrates. So in, in both the flora and the fauna, we often think of maybe the trees and the, and the birds, but we mustn't forget uh, what's maybe unfortunately called the lower species, but you know, they're equally, each species is as important as another in a biodiversity world. And then we have the habitats in which they live. So a habitat is anywhere where there's flora and fauna. So everywhere on a farm has some flora and fauna. Uh, even the, the ryegrass fields and the, and the crops, they have some flora and fauna, but obviously uh, more important habitats or what we normally call habitats then have, have, um, have either a lot more uh, flora and fauna or sometimes they have rare species of flora and fauna. And not to forget the soil biodiversity, um, an interesting fact from Fiona Brennan, there is a quarter of all organisms on the planet are found in soil. Uh, a healthy soil has approximately 5 million earthworms per hectare. So it's very, very complex. Um, you know, and as I said, underground is just as important as the overground. So as I said, this is Biodiversity Week. Um, so when we're minding our biodiversity, we need to maintain all our native species of flora and fauna, which have been here for 10,000 years and are in tune with each other with regards to timing of flowering and other growth stages. And just an interesting quote I came across once, and it is, it is very important that Dumont um, in 2005 warned of the dangers of aesthetically pleasing or charismatic species being favoured over ugly ones. Because as, as I say, from a, from a scientific 
um, uh, point of view, which biodiversity is, is the way it is, it is the way we treat it in, in Chagask, uh, each species is equal. So next question is why native species are best for biodiversity. So again, they're in tune with each other. As I said, they've been around with each other for the past 10,000 years. Um, and you know their timing of flowering, the timing of budding, leaf fall, all the different um, life cycles. So the, the food chain there is a good example that when, when something happens, uh, it needs to be in tune with its associated species. And again, just one of the many studies that show the how the native trees were always very conscious. I think that our willow and oak have tremendous amount of, of associated biodiversity. All our native species do, but our non-native ones um, are not as in tune with the associated biodiversity. And then we have a second layer, uh, which is very important to understand why native species of Irish provenance are best. So we can have a native species like whitethorn, um, which is native to Ireland. It is also a species, a native species in Eastern Europe, but they are not going to act the same. So when we talk about Irish provenance, we talk about plants grown from seeds collected from Irish plants growing in Ireland for the past 10,000 years. The origin of plants or seeds determines their adaptability, quality and wildlife value. So, for example, trees of the same species adapted to different regions of Europe can bud, burst, flower and seed at different times. Irish birds, mammals and insects have co-adapted with local Irish tree species of Irish provenance. And the, there is an issue about Irish tree seed sent abroad and the seedlings are re-imported, may be called Irish origin, but there is a risk there to carrying pests and diseases. So assuming it's native, um, yeah, with that native and Irish provenance. The next issue then in the more general term is not all flora and fauna are as good for biodiversity. And we have three here that I go through the invasive alien species, introduced species and ornamental species. So invasive alien species, um, these have some, some native species can be considered pests or invasive. For example, you'll often hear farmers talking about something invading the field. It could be the, the blackthorn growing out. It could be hazel in the barren. It could be rushes taking over. So that's invasive. But the word alien is really important here. Um, invasive alien species, they're definitely non-native species. They were introduced into Ireland either accidentally or deliberately and they, they cause damage to our environment and they have serious consequences for, for biodiversity. The main issue is they, they outcompete um, native species and there's no, you know, it, it, they're not in tune and they, um, yeah, as I said, they, they take over. And there are up to 100 invasive alien species in Ireland. They include both flora and fauna. I put in the grey squirrel there just to, to show the point. And some are more damaging than others. Um, but they're all, we need to be very careful um, with them all and to seek professional advice before, uh, before, 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 before treating them or, or going at them, or we can do more harm than good. Ornamental species. Um, you can see the, in the foreground there is the, the ornamental holly. In background, difficult to see there, but it's actually the, the, the native holly hedge. Um, so the ornamental species are bred for, for, for how they look and perhaps their disease control. I remember an example once of somebody um, uh, talking about the, the benefits of the, the, the ornamental willow because it, it keeps its lovely shiny leaves to the end of the year. It doesn't get kind of shot through like our wild willows do. But obviously, you know, it, the willow, our, our native willow can look kind of ragged at the end of the year because it, um, it, it's because of all the associated um, biodiversity that's living on it. So, you know, it's, if it's about looks, you may want ornamental and that's fine, but not for biodiversity. Introduced species. Again, uh, these have been introduced in recent centuries, um, but they're still not belonging to our, our native, that they don't go back to 10,000 years. And there's lots of these, but the, the common ones that people maybe get a little bit surprised is the chestnut, the sycamore and the beech. Um, they're not as good to support wildlife. They don't fit in as well on our farms. And you don't actually find them once you go out the land on a farm. Um, you do not find these. 
The, uh, the following flora are native and do support native fauna, uh, but for mostly historic reasons, these six have been declared as noxious weeds under the Noxious Weeds Act 1936. So that will tell you how long ago it ha has been. Um, however, we don't want fields of thistles, so our, 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 our ragworth, our docks, so they should be kept under control either by mechanical means or they can be spot sprayed. The, so we have the ragwort, the thistles and the docks and the three more um, unusual ones to, to people's minds would be the common barberry. It has a fungus uh, which causes, causes black stem rust in cereals, which would have been a problem in the past. The male wild hop caused problems in the past. Uh, for brewing when we were brewing and for commercial hop crops um, and the spring wild oat again is difficult to control in cereals so it's just to understand those that they are a kind of a unique little group they are native um, but they are they, we, we are allowed to control them in but only you know carefully and where, where needs be so why should we care about biodiversity now that we know what it is from a farmer's point of view um, there's a number of reasons why the farmer needs to be um, very clear on, wh on what biodiversity is. The first one being the legislation. There is law about timing of hedge cutting and scrub removal. Um, so that's, that's obviously the law is the law. Uh, financial is a major one because a lot of the schemes, the agri-environment schemes, and in the future more the... Um, the basic payment scheme, the eco schemes, you know, there is more money associated with biodiversity. And um, so it's something that most farmers cannot afford to ignore. And equally, from a marketing point of view, we have a green image for our food. And, um, you know, we, we it is very valuable and we want to, we're very proud of it. And we want to, keep, you know, we, we want to um, live up to it and ensure it's there. And we have superb farms, but we need to just understand what's really good and, and promote it and be very clear then what we are trying to do. The fourth one is one I might not have said coming from kind of a scientific and a don't, not wanting to look too soft, but farmers say this to me all the time about well-being and how it's nice to have a nice farm. Um, you know, it's not the first thing maybe they talk about at a discussion group, but when they, when they know what, that I appreciate it, um, they're quietly proud of, of having a nice farm. And they often talk about passing it on to the next generation, a farm that's rich in nature. So that's a really, a really nice, um, and that is genuinely, I would say, true of most farmers. Um, the, the natural capital approach, which we've heard about on these, on these um, webinars before, it's not about putting a price on nature, it's about valuing nature. And look, there's so many things. I'm not even going to read through the different, um, all the different words there that nature provides to us, but they kind of can be grouped in for provisioning, that's the food and the fuel, regulating, that's the pollination and the water purification. The cultural, I suppose that comes back to my well-being about um, you know, the spiritual or religious values, knowledge systems, recreation. So I think that's that's one that's probably come up a lot in the last number of years with COVID and with people definitely having more of a sense of nature. I would um, you know, I've been working at this since having come back to Ireland in 95 and started of the, the reps. Uh, and, you know, I can genuinely say it's only in the last two years that I think there's a, a turn in, in this, that, you know, there's a genuine interest and uh, on kind of understanding, now sometimes misunderstanding, so that's what we're about, supporting then is the soil and the photosynthesis and the primary production, so there, that's um, why you were important in it. And then just to, again, to go back to the one that I think is capturing people's people's heart um, is the, there's a, a few quotes that uh, Kaplan explained the powerful role of natural environments in directed attention, a key psychological resource in coping with challenges. Um, and way back 150 years ago, Rowe highlighted how natural environments can contribute to alleviating mental health problems, problems, both in terms of supporting good mental health, maintenance and recovery. And the way he explained it was that attending to the natural stimuli, such as the gentle rustle of trees in the breeze or other sights and sounds of nature, it requires little effort and often res respite from a cognitive load. So you kind of forget your troubles when you're out um, in nature. 
um, and that the, the, uh, the gentle rustle of the breeze there is particularly true for our lovely aspen tree. It's one of our native um, trees. And if you see the, the way the stems come at, at a, rather than running flat into the leaf, they're kind of, they're at right angles to the leaf. And on a, the most still day, you will see the aspen fluttering. You will, you will spot it. Um, and it just reminded me very much when I read that about what Rose said about the, the gentle rustle of trees in the breeze. So that's just one example. Um, now, the next problem is we, we know it's important. We know what it is. Um, and why should we worry about it now? And the reason we need to be very concerned about it now is that nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. And again, we have all the evidence now, and um, we cannot say it's not happening. Um, the International Platform on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services back in 2019 came up with 1 million animal and plant species threatened with extinction. Um, the Millennium Assessment did good work around the Millennium published in 2005, you know, uh, concluding that biodiversity has always evolved, because people often say, well, sure, there was always change. But the, the problem now is that changes in the past 50 years have been more rapid than at any time in human history. And species extinction rates over the past few hundred years have increased by as much as 1,000 times the background rates typical over the Earth's history. And then recent, um, or the, the, the Living Planet Index is another one that, that talks about, uh, in, that, in this case, the difference between 1970 and, and 2006, 30% decrease in species. And a more recent report there in 2019 will, um, look, reviewed 73 historical reports and predicted an extinction of 40% of the world's insects. So these are worrying figures. No different in Ireland. Um, and on May, the 8th of May 2019, um, Ireland declared a climate and biodiversity emergency. So we need to keep biodiversity up on the, up on the ladder there. So just to, to throw up a few facts from Ireland, um, on our flora side, there's a flora protection order um, for some of our rarer species. And again, 60 flowering plants with ferns, mosses, liverworts, lichens, and stoneworts on that list. Um, on the fauna side of it, um, of the three amphibians, the natural tract toad down in Kerry is endangered. The, of the 15 native fish species, um, we have a number of them there. Our European eel is critically endangered. Five are vulnerable, um, and uh, sea lamprey is near threatened. So, and the invertebrates then there's a, a lot more knowledge now about these than would have been, you know, twenty even even twenty years ago. So even within Ireland, damselflies and dragonflies, um, four out of the twenty-four species are threatened. Twelve out of our thirty-five butterfly species and 73 out of our 244 water beetles and of 150 land and freshwater mollusks, 53 are threatened. These come from the um, NPWS Irish uh, wildlife manuals. The data is all on the, on the web. Uh, you know, it's a huge amount of data now available. So look, I think you've got the picture. Um, I suppose the birds maybe, some of us are, are, would identify more with these. So we know about the, the birds of conservation concern in Ireland, the Bucky list, the come and you know the, the red list of birds, the real, and there's 28 on that, but the ones that we know about would be the barn owl, the swift, the corn crake, um, other passaging, wintering, and, and the, the breeding and wintering ones, the lapwing, curly and snipe, very important on, on farms. And then the amber list, uh, 43 breeding species, including the skylark, hen harrier, kingfish, or swallow. Um, so, you know, ones that we maybe think are doing OK or we see them on farms, um, but just to be they're really, really important where we have them to, to look after them. And the same story with our bees on World Bee Day. I will focus on the bees a little. Um, we have our 100, 100 species. Uh, uh, we have the one honeybee species but our, and 20 bumblebees and 77 solitary bees. So one third of our bee species are in threatened with extinction because of a reduction in flowers. Uh, they need pollen, the protein, and they need the nectar, the carbohydrate. Lack of continuity of flowers. Bees need flowers all year round, not just a crop on, on one day or one week. So they need a diversity of flowering plants in the landscape. Um, and there are less nesting sites in, in, on farms. 
And then the habitats. So we've touched on flora, fauna, and now finally onto the habitats. How do they stand? Um, our SACs, special areas of conservation, um, are, are designated for habitats or species. And again, Ireland um, is obliged to report on these under Article 17, it's called every six years on their status. So the third report in 2019 stated that most of the SAC habitats are in unfavorable status. Almost half the sites are demonstrating ongoing declines. Uh, the majority of the species listed in the Habitats Directive are in favorable status and stable, although a small number are bad. But so the trend is, is worrying on the habitats. So before we do anything, um, remember, actions to protect our declining biodiversity must be evidence-based and directed by science rather than individual and uninformed personal preference. It's not about actions that make the landscape attractive to humans or about focusing on one species at the expense of others. Some native Irish biodiversity are inconspicuous, I won't use the word ugly, but, um, but they may not be showy or attractive to humans. Um, so the three messages I have bearing all that in mind for Biodiversity Week and World Bee Day is, uh, don't sow, let it grow, value what's growing wild, part of our native Irish biodiversity, allow a thorn tree grow up and mature in every topped hedge, and do not cut escaped hedges. So I'll run through these three, three points, three very simple points, um, which would make a huge difference um, and everybody can do them. So don't sow, let it grow. I suppose we're um, for on farmland, and uh, this is in, 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 in tandem with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, I really want to value what's growing wild naturally. That's part of our native biodiversity, and that's what we should be focusing on, what, what is valuable. Um, and because of that, um, back in springtime, um, Amy McKeever in the Irish Country Living asked me to do something on, on hedges and things in the countryside. So um, despite me not having much time, I said this is just, I was so passionate about promoting what we are, uh, what's growing wild. Um, that I did a little, I, it's ongoing, um, and according to Amy, it's, it's, it's been very well received by, by farming and countryside people. So I'm just going to run through some of the examples that I did. Um, so again, I, this was just literally a photo a week, um, what's out there, as I said, maybe un, inconspicuous. It is lovely to know what's out there when you are going for a walk. So this was back in, in March, um, the hazel lambstails, one of the first signs of spring, um, they're the male flowers which release pollen to the wind on warmer days. The female flowers are fewer and found lower down on the tree to catch the pollen drifting downwards. The female flowers uh, at this, this stage look like little red buds or filaments sticking out. And if they're fertilized, they'll form the hazelnuts. Um, so that's the hazel um, wind pollinated. The ivy, again, can be a controversial subject. Uh, love it or hate it. And it can... Um, I'm on the kind of the love side of it, but I do agree with colleagues where um, it has, it can take over, but often I, I saw examples lately of hedges and I'll show one later, um, the, the, the overmanaged hedge and then the ivy gets on top of it and it really is, is the end. It's the end quicker maybe than it would have been. Um, but the ivy berries, this was now back in March, that the, the, the very, very last of the ivy berries were still hanging on. So that's really important food for the birds in the, in, at the, towards the end of winter um, before, you know, before other things become come available. Um, so for birds like blackbirds and thrushes and um, the berries, in, you know, you'll notice they're green and hard all through the winter. So they, they kind of, they stay until this stage. And, you know, it's very different. Oftentimes I catch people out when I show them that picture on the top or, or show them the actual plant and they don't recognize it as ivy. They think of the ivy more as the, the, the climbing stage. Um, another very early one, um, these ones have a, their whole mechanism is to get out and flower and be done their life cycle before the growth comes and they get crowded out. Uh, lesser celadine, it's a low, really fast growing plant, one of the first flowers in spring when the temperatures begin to rise, um, but the hedgerow shrubs are not yet, you know, uh, shading out the light. Um, so even in fine weather, it only opens during the day. Um, so it's very uh, interesting if you go out to take a photo of it early morning or late night, it'll be closed up. 
So it's just a, an, a, a, an interesting point on it. The Blackthorn um, around St. Patrick's Day, I want St. Patrick's Day come, you kind of think of looking out for it, depending on the year, obviously it varies, but very distinctive white flowers on black stems um, before the leaves come. Um, so very different to white thorn that I'm going to show you later. Um, but again, very, it's just at this stage, the, the black thorn hedges are, are, appear covered in clouds of snow white flowers. Um, and as I said, it's a good time to differentiate it from white thorn. Then we have the, the willow or the sally, uh, incredibly important for biodiversity. Um, these are the, the pussy willows or the willow catkins. Uh, there are several varieties of willow um, in native to Ireland. They grow in damp areas, hence where I deliberately put in the water behind them there, um, flowering early in spring, providing a nearly source of pollen for bees. Um, the brimstone peacock, comma, and small tortoise shell butterflies waking up from the long winter hibernation, parched for nectar, head straight to the willow, um, supporting many invertebrates. It's a, it's a fantastic um, plant for biodiversity. And I know during Hedgerow Week last, last year, we heard from, from the experts and the easiest way to improve an existing, if you have a gap in a hedge and you want to put to add biodiversity, you, you stick in a slip of a willow and you will be guaranteed to increase your biodiversity. The primrose, I think we all know that one, it's probably my favourite flower, um, remembering going back to childhood, picking it and, and bringing it as presents to elderly people. Um, again, it comes early, it's just beautiful, and only the long-tongued insects can reach the nectars, including bumblebees. So again, just making the note that things are connected to very specific things. Lady smock or cuckoo flower, um, still out there, I saw that out yesterday. Um, out in Mayo, and it is, um, yes, yeah, some people call it the two names. It's kind of pinky white flowers, slightly damper fields and, and roadsides. Um, the lady refer, referred to in it is, is Our Lady, and um, the cuckoo spit uh, is the alternative name because it, it comes out when the cuckoo is around, um, but it, has no, it is not, um, it's not, not related to the cuckoo, but because uh, the foam. Uh, that maybe people thought the cuckoo may have um, left on it is actually comes from frog hopper nymphs who live in the stems. And this is the favorite plant of the orange tip and green veined butterflies. And you will spot the orange tip butterfly on it. Um, so watch out for that. Now, love it or hate it, the dandelion is part of our native biodiversity. And um, it's, it's another one that divides the, the public but it does have a huge biodiversity value. Um, each flower contains approximately 200 florets, producing an abundance of nectar and pollen. Um, now it does have the, the long taproot storing food gives its, uh, and its ability to set seed without pollination and the great quantities of easily dispersed seed give the dandelion properties considered to be characteristics of weeds. Now, of course, a weed is a plant in the wrong place. So I suppose what we're trying to say today is um, we know the baddies, um, but after that, everything, rather than saying it should be gone, think, do I need to get rid of it? Is, is it okay to have it here? Because there is a mentality that, you know, if where people see what they perceive to be weeds, they think, well, I better get rid of them or people will think I'm lazy or whatever. Um, beautiful, uh, greater stitch worth. Uh, growing along the base of hedges, it kind of clambers up over other vegetation to give a stunning display. Um, again, really useful. The, the name comes from, from its use in folk med medicine to um, cure stitches or pains. Um, and it's a lovely starry display. The white thorn, well, look at, again, no doubt my favourite tree, um, often not left seen as a tree, as it is in that picture there in Galway. Um, but again, very different to the black thorn, but people, not everybody can distinguish them. And it is very easy. The, you can see there, the, first of all, the flowers only come on the leaves, always around silage time, it usually appears whenever you see the first um, picture of silage cutting and um, the beautiful little palmate like oak like leaves. Um, and again, uh, just of incredible importance for, for biodiversity. Um, and again, we heard from Jasmine Harding during Hedgerow Week there about, I think it was 62, or lots and lots of species of moths that grow on, that, that use, um, use that. And just to finish on, you'll be glad I've only done about 10 of them so far. Um, cow parsley, stunning at the moment displays in the, um, 
in, in the, it's an umbel, um, an umbel flower, an umbel is just means that there's a load of stalks coming from the one point where the flowers um, all come from. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it, cow parsley, it's a, it's, it's a very conspicuous plant. And um, it was also called uh, ladies lace and used to decorate May altars uh, because it's kind of really delicate and the fern like leaves. Um, it is, yeah, it's, it's an iconic part of our, our Irish countryside. You'll see it, you know, on places where you have beautiful white thorn in flower at the moment, the white flower, the white thorn flower drooping down is meeting the cow parsley, you know, coming up. So it's, um, it's really a splash of white. Now, uh, this is what is not growing wild. And you can see there it is on a roadside. So uh, without question, safety comes first. Um, and I suppose you don't see too much of this along, along roadsides, but it does occasionally happen. And, and um, I suppose it's just to, to make the point that, you know, neat and tidy is not, is not everything. And a lawn there, if it's, if it's lawned, would not be a lot better for, for the flowering plants. So I think it's really about uh, thinking about, you know, on farm roadways, places where we can let things grow um, and give, as I said, I really am I'm strong on the fact that people sometimes think they need to tidy everywhere. So uh, neatness and tidiness is the bane of our lives in, in, in the biodiversity world. So just think before, you know, can I, can I let things flower? There's a lot of, you know, what's missing on, on, in, on Irish farms at the moment is the flowering um, uh, species that would have been there 40 years ago. And there are still places we can leave them without interfering with our, our, um, our, our production. So just the other two points then briefly, because we've often talked about these before, um, in, in our top hedges to allow a flowering thorn grow. Um, again, you can see in the bottom picture uh, taken in Grange there last week, you know, beautiful uh, flowering thorns popping out of the, and they've only been left in, 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 in the recent few years. Um, so there's already producing flowers and will produce buckets even in the top hedges. So, and then without, uh, we must always recognize uh, the escape hedges, which are incredibly important. Um, they have, their benefit is in the canopy and look at that beautiful, the amount on that hedge. Now it does have a, a weaker base. So this is why we want on farms, we want some top hedges and some escape hedges and both have a different role, but the top hedges is good if we leave the occasional tree in it. The escaped hedge are the biggest, biggest threat to this is that, again, people think I must, um, it's useless, I'll tidy it up. And they think they should, and they end up topping it. And you can see what happens on the bottom side, the upside down toilet brush hedge uh, will, will have no flowers. And also it will not have the base to sustain um, constant topping at the same level and that hedge dies out. And that is a serious issue for a lot of our top hedges. They're, they're not, they haven't got the base to support the topping that's needed. So summary, uh, just remember, don't so let it grow, uh, value uh, what is growing wild part of our native Irish biodiversity, don't top the escaped hedges and allow a thorn tree to grow up in every top hedge. Baramagi. Thank you, Catherine. That was a really lovely journey through Irish uh, nature and particularly those photographs, I think were really uh, clearly demonstrated the, the, the biodiversity we, we have on our countryside. Um, Lots and lots of interest in today. We've got a huge number of people joining us this morning and lots of questions coming through. I suppose my question to you, Catherine, is uh, we're, we're doing a lot. Um, is it enough? Are we, is the response urgent enough given that uh, this ha we, a biodiversity crisis has been declared or emergency declared in Ireland? Um, I note that there was a a recent uh, discussion at the Citizens' Assembly about biodiversity as well. Um, and, and given all of that, uh, are there sufficient policy measures and, and actions being taken uh, by, by Ireland to, to respond to this uh, decline in biodiversity? Well, I suppose I'd always like to see more. You won't be surprised to say that, to hear me say that. Uh, but I do think what we're missing, what we, what is seriously um, important is the education side, the simple messages. Um, and I know, you know, sometimes people look down on oversimplification, but, you know, it, it's, it's heartbreaking when you see people thinking they're doing right. And, you know, when we know it's not right. 
So we could do a lot better if we all understood um, simple messages. And then look, we need more and more support in every, because this, this topic covers and more than farmland, obviously. I mean, my focus is on farmland, but the same messages are relevant to your, to your garden, to your, you know, to your village, to your tidy town. Um, so there's this huge amount that we could do here, Mark. And there's some really great examples of farmers across the country. I recently visited a number of farms across Ireland as part of a, an, an awards uh, programme, and it was really uh, heartening to see the, the passion that's out there. And, and actually, a degree of frustration amongst some farmers with some other, or, or other not necessarily farmers, but, you know, the likes of spring uh, ditches with, with Roundup, you know, just to tidy them up and that type of thing. It's, it's, and, and I, see, I see more and more gardens actually leaving uh, the lawn and to maybe just cutting around. So I, I think that awareness is certainly growing. Um, and uh, I, I agree that education piece is, 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 is really important. You talked about the soil uh, biodiversity and that a quarter of organisms uh, on the planet are found in our soils. Uh, are we doing enough in Ireland in, in, in relation to protecting that biodiversity within our soils? I don't know, Mark. I'm not an expert. Um, Fiona Brennan I, I, we, I would be the person to, to answer that. And um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I assume a lot of what we do for our general biodiversity messages, you know, looking after, and especially our species with grassland and those soils will be looked after, if you know what I mean. It, there won't be a different message, I don't think. But I, and I think soil... Um, yeah, we're not we're not in danger of soil blowing away in Ireland, the physical structure. Um, but it's yeah. So I listen. I don't know enough, Mark. No, no that's fair enough, and, yeah. and maybe an unfair question mm. uh, to you, um, Pat. So, so lots and lots of questions coming through there. Yeah, uh, quite quite a number. Um, I I just uh, give you one. Uh, just lost it here for a second. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and it's it's not a simple one, Catherine, so uh, uh, maybe it's a little unfair as the first question. Uh, could Catherine speak on what are the main drivers of biodiversity loss in Ireland and what outlook for biodiversity there is given current policy? OK, no, well, I think it's fair enough that land use change is, is definitely the, the, the driver. Um, but if we like. It's a case of where do we want to be? I suppose for the last, um, you know, since since I started in this world, um, the question was, we food production was more important, you know, um, as a policy, and we were, you know, it was kind of a scheme issue. It was a, um, it was acknowledged as being valuable, but at the same time, but I think what's changed now is that, you know, we cannot produce food now without it, without maintaining the biodiversity. Because what I mean is, I don't know that we want to go back to the the 1950s. We wouldn't have the amount of food that we have today. Um, I worked up in, in Cavan at the beginning of the old Area 8 and, you know, when I was doing the maps, the, the, a, a half acres was the size of the fields that we were adding up, um, you know, they had already been removed, but like, if we were, if we remain at that stage, we wouldn't have the food production, so it's a balance. And I think the, the policies have moved on tremendously in the, as I said, in the last two years, I sense a huge change, whether it's enough or not, um, but we need to keep 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 the pressure on and I expect it will only go in one way and that's often what I say to farmers who kind of say well maybe it won't be worth my while this time you know joining the scheme because it'll mean too much but I mean maybe next time around all their payments could be I don't know but you know it's it's a one-way uh, direction as far as I'm concerned but food production is a critical part of our you know it's 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 still I, I wouldn't I'm not forgetting food production. Yeah, and I suppose that that kind of uh, uh, leads into the second question: the don't sow, let it grow. Great idea indeed, but how do we deal with fertilized soils where arable weeds will dominate and, and okay, uh, no, the more soil soil wildflowers won't succeed? Yeah, no, that's a really good question, and that's where I wouldn't be doing this option. I mean, that's where if I had a a, a, a soil that's high in nutrients, it will not support um, the biodiversity that was there 50 years ago. So an option for that would be wild bird cover. If I had my 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 way, that would be a superb place to grow um, a wild bird cover, a, a crop for wildlife rather is what I call it, because then you're actually sowing oats, linseed and letting the whatever annual weeds come up. So there's a there's a different uh, story for every field. So that is not where I would be trying to encourage um, 
you know, let it grow. I'm really talking about small areas or, you know, around the place. Yeah, yeah and I think, sorry, go on, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to, there was a question here, uh, Catherine, in relation to biodiversity in uplands um, and, and higher ground and the, describing sheep as living lawnmowers and eating anything that moves, but they're, they're looking for your thoughts on, on this and, and plans for fencing, reducing, uh, considering uh, that, that without grants, there would be no real economy for this form of farming. So I know there's been a huge change in policy in response to uh, overgrazing in, in maybe 20 years ago. Uh, but, but where where is that now? Or where what? are we at now? Look, our up uplands aren't, aren't all in good condition. We have some undergrazed, some overgrazed, oftentimes on the same part, because the bit they don't graze gets undergrazed, gets, gets scrubby or too mature, and then they overgraze the bit that's good. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mixture up there, but it is all about getting the right farming system up there. And it's a farming system. It's, we need to be thinking about the least cost system because it doesn't make money for food. If, we, if you make money for food, you can just graze them, you know, put them up on the hill for a little bit, but that will not maintain the biodiversity. And to say there are lawnmowers, we need the lawnmowers to a point, you know, the, the, the um, and we, so it's, a, it's about the right stocking rate, but equally the right timing and the right system. If millennia isn't grazed early in the year, um, and there's some fantastic projects there now, and I've heard farmers talk about how by grazing with cattle earlier, suddenly it became a field available to sheep, which otherwise they would never have touched. Mm -hmm. So we there know is. a lot more now, and, but it's the, getting the right farming system, the right hill hardy sheep that will do the job, the least cost job, because we're not going to make money out of it. And there is that welcome change to how schemes are being designed now, this results-based approach where farmers are being paid or rewarded for delivering biodiversity. I mean, that, that is a, a fairly seismic change in, in how, mm. how schemes are being delivered. Uh, does that, do you think, is, is that going to yield uh, more positive impacts for well, us over the next number of years? Definitely the right message, because when you before went out to a, a farm that had a piece of unimproved grassland, when an advisor went out, and it was full of the most beautiful species, actually, that we saw on a farm yesterday in Mayo. And, um, you know, before that, there was no option. There was no financial benefit to retaining it. Um, now there is. That farmer can get 450 euros per hectare for that field versus zero in a ryegrass field, um, assuming all the, the schemes fit, et cetera, et cetera. But the right message is there. So the advisor, I know an advisor um, in Longford said to me, like, the, it's the first time in, since we started doing Rex um, that you could actually explain that th there is a value to that you know species rich field and they're you know getting rarer they're gems we need to, so that's the way to maintain them so the principle is absolutely good that's when there's a a, a, a question here it says uh, great presentation first and that's a that's a common theme in, in some of the, the the questions that are coming through uh, there's a push towards uh, using clover and multi-species swords to reduce fertilizer and reduce gas greenhouse gas emissions can these solutions to reducing greenhouse gas help improve biodiversity on, on commercial farms? Um, I, we don't, I don't, and I know in general, my colleagues who don't consider that a biodiversity measure. It's absolutely valuable from a nutrient point of view. I, I'm not an expert on that, but, um, so, but it's, not, it's not what you would do for biodiversity. You would be doing it in a, in a high fert fertile field, uh, a ryegrass sward type field. If it's managed, there won't be much flowering. There probably will be some more biodiversity than that. I wouldn't be doing that measure for biodiversity only. Okay. I suppose a comment here or a question. I've been working with tidy town committees in small villages and supporting them to do more work for biodiversity, but I'm very disappointed that they do not have active links with farmers. Any suggestions as to how to, to promote this, this type of relationship? Yeah, I suppose it's it's kind of it's not our remit. I get involved a little bit, but I mean, advisors, I suppose um, it's a local issue, isn't it? And local contacts. Um, and it is really important because I think both what tidy towns and what county councils do are important beyond what their their area because they give messages to to farmers in particular if that's the way the head should be cut then they should know what they're doing similarly to, to tidy town so um yeah well i mean i we certainly work with them and um, they've engaged with hedgerow week and hopefully will again 
Um, so what what can I say, Pat? Yeah, it's it's very local issue, if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'd suggest uh, maybe the reaching out to the local farm our farmers mm. association or Macron Pharma uh, can be very very active groups in, in those areas. So would be I'm sure happy to link with the uh, tidy towns. Uh, the, 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 the question there, again, uh, com commenting on the, 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 the quality of the presentation, can farmers be encouraged to rewild and or plant native trees on part of their land? Look, I love trees, they're carbon, they're, they're quick in it, but I, I suppose when you say rewild, um, we need to be careful. What, what do we want in there in 10, 15 years' time? If, if we want uh, scrub woodland, the trees will actually come themselves in time um, it, it, and scrub is fantastic habitat. If we want grassland, which is where, where in general, when I'm looking at those flowers, that's where, where they'd be cut and uh, need maintenance. They need to be cut or grazed, but cut or grazed later in the year, ideally after September, if it's an area. So I suppose I wouldn't call that rewilding and the other one is yeah a scrub but planting native trees quickens the process otherwise they come naturally given time but uh, absolutely planting native trees of irish provenance is, is super you know and we only have about 15 of them so uh, you know anybody with a farm it'd be lovely to have all all 15 ish species just out of interest wouldn't it a question there, are there any examples of, of good practice and, and initiatives in the, in the upland area? And I suppose the, 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 the EIPs come into to mind there. Uh, yeah, so, super, super work going on in the uplands. I mean, we know so much more now than we do. Um, yeah, we have five smaller upland EIPs, SUS, um, Black Sears Farming Futures, Inishon, Connemara and the McGillicuddy Reeks. We have the Pearl Mussel and Hen Harrier project. Who, who, who touch on uplands, you know, very much the pearl mussel, and they both do. And then we have a very exciting project of wild Atlantic nature with a large number of farmers, um, you know, engage, being scored and engaging in, in, in this. So, yeah, and we're moving into a new era next year with the cooperation projects and with, with the Agri Environment Climate Measure Scheme, the new GLASS. So the uplands is a very exciting area to be working in. So if, yeah, and if people Google the EIP Ireland, uh, I think they'll probably get to the, the examples of those uh, innovative pro uh, programs that are, are going and Pat, on. Just while you're talking there, it might be worth mentioning that we're going to have a, a focus on uplands. Um, we have three or four, five, four fantastic speakers lined up in July, August this, this summer. So we will be having a focus on uplands and, and be featuring all that kind of material on, the, on, this, on this webinar. A question for international bee day is it possible to get a rough estimate of, of the bee population in, in in ireland and i suppose the question is how good is our information now on on uh bees that are threatened uh, etc i think it's much better now that's certainly one for ruth and una um in the biodiversity data center um but I, uh, yeah they have huge i think we have fantastic information now i don't know if they would like to do more i'm sure they would but um yeah so i don't know numbers pat I mean, we know numbers of species, but I presume you're talking about, you know, where they are or where they're disappearing from. But again, they're disappearing from where the where the flowers aren't. And again, I'm talking about the flowers growing wild in our magnificent old species rich grasslands and in those um, linear habitats, you know, along roadsides, in, uh, uh, along every hedge, around every field, you know, could is, there is potential for having this fantastic, um, you know, bank of, of, um, of flora. And associated fauna. So the question here: Do do trees or plants of non-Irish provenance eventually adapt to our climate uh, after many flowering seasons? And has any research been done on that? And if so, how long would this kind of a, a, adaptation? I think I think I know what your answer is going to be yeah. on this one. I don't, I don't know. And I suppose it's always uh, the precautionary principles. You know what I mean? We don't know everything. You know, but all we know, we can be sure that when we're dealing with the stuff that's been here for ten thousand years, we cannot go wrong. And we do know of enough examples where it can go very wrong. Um, so it, there's a bit in the middle. Then maybe we don't know every, everything, but we know enough. Yeah, and I think the, the slide you had on the numbers of, of species supported by the various types of trees was, was to me, was absolutely startling. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and, uh, and when you think of your, your not, not yours, Pat, but the hedge around houses, uh, you know, um, the, 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 you know, the typical hedges that are around houses, you kind of get the sense there's nothing in them, don't you? 
mm. as opposed to when you walk along a, a white thorn dominated hedge. Yeah, it makes, it makes such a difference. There's a question here in relation to uh, a message or asking, do you think the message of no cut may and letting the flowers in the garden grow um, will actually help the bees? Or is it better to try and leave a small section of garden to go wild completely for the whole year? Well, again, go back to going wild completely. Do you want scrub or do you want grassland? If you want grassland, and I'm talking about old grassland, you know, grassy margins, um, to, they must be cut at least every kind of three years um, on a farm. I would love to see where they have grassy margins, maybe cutting in rotation, because leaving them over the winter, again, the big clumps of, of coxfoot or whatever, that's where the spiders overwinter. So, you know, we, we want diversity is the word here. Um, so in your garden, you do what suits. You obviously possibly want some lawn for, for, for children to play on, etc. cetera. Um, the, 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 the no mow may or, you know, don't mow, but that the don't mow means cutting it then in September or cutting it um, every few years or you, you turn into scrub. All are good. It's a case of you pick what suits you all are good. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's so many different uh, asks of farmers at the moment, Catherine, between climate change, water quality, soil quality, biodiversity. And you, you talked about the education, the importance of education, and not, not just for farmers. I mean, the, the entire industry and country. Uh, but what, what do you think could be done there to, to provide uh, support or what needs to happen to, to, to improve those, those supports and, and to to support that change, I guess, that's needed uh, at, at a, a farm level? Well, I think understanding the basics, like what I presented there, and it's actually not complicated. I mean, I don't think many people would, would profess to, to talk about climate change measures on farms who aren't, you know, in the business. But I suppose the slight disadvantage of biodiversity is everybody thinks they know because they do know something. And I mean, wildlife, it's, it's, photo, it's the wildlife in photo park, it's the wildlife in the zoo. So we get, it's a wee bit complicated, but if the simple basics are understood, you don't need to know all the plants or all the flowers or all the, it just, that inspires people, I think. So very little would, would, uh, would help Mark. It's yeah. just the right messages. And the main message is just to leave space for nature where you can. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that goes back to your your message about uh, don't sow, let it let it grow. Um, yeah. Yeah. There are First still all, have, conflicting have... messages around that, aren't there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, have the place first of all, but then, you know, think of your lawn, there's no flower heads there, there's no, you know, and even it doesn't have to be flowery to be valuable. You know, you have, um, like when farmers would start off with a grassy margin, you'll have cocks, but you can even have rye grass. The fact that it sets seed, the seed eating birds eat the seed there's invertebrates then on the seed so you'll have the birds eating the invertebrates on the seed so I'm talking about even just having ryegrass going to seed in the margin over time as we know to keep the ryegrass in the middle of the field it needs fertilizer and it needs grazing the minute you pull the fertilizer and the grazing from the the strip that I want um, it will automatically, um, you know, go, farmers know this, it will, it will automatically get uh, enriched. And, but it doesn't have to look showy, is my point is that it's uh, structurally, that's where the, the, uh, the field mice and the, the shrews will be. That's where the barn owls fly along at night. So it's, um, yeah. There is that, that mindset change of it doesn't have to be neat and tidy. Uh, Correct. In fact, it's, yeah, it's the opposite. The, the, new, the new aesthetic, uh, I think we need to get our yes. heads around a, a change in what we think is right. And we had a, a, a question from a farmer a few weeks ago about leaving a, a stretch uh, beside the, the, the sheds uh, uh, untidy and uh, that his wife would, would uh, kill him if it wasn't done, but uh, he, he's, he was getting justification for it. So uh, he wasn't to be named, but it was Harry Kingston. <laughs> uh, sorry, just in a uh, question there, uh, birds, bees and, and wildlife need uh, food year, all year round. And you talked about the white tarn hedge, but uh, the question about, and I think you, you've kind of dealt with it, is, is the necessity for providing flowering plants and I suppose to complement those, what are the key uh, areas that you would see on the farm that can complement those at other times of the year? Yeah, well, I think just on the hedges side, uh, there's loads of types of hedges, but there's two types basically are topped and escaped. And number one, all farms should have both. 
because they both have a huge um, different differing uh, value. So the escaped hedge has is full of flowers, and uh, the top hedge has not so many flowers, but can have. It, it, there's lots of top hedges, hasn't a flower to be seen. If there's no white today, when you look out at your hedges, you will have no flowers and you will have no fruit. And um, so a, a bit of both, and um, you know, managed right then having your grassy margins. So I'm talking about an, an, an improved farm. So you're, you're back to your, your hedges, your grassy margins. Um, now, when we move into the, 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 the fantastic um, species-rich grasslands, I mean, they, they speak for themselves. They don't even need margins because the middle of the field is so good. Uh, a question about the companies providing and selling wildflower seeds, uh, a comment? I suppose I deal with farmland, Pat, so I'm very clear, you know, on, on a farmland point of view. Uh, like people plant flowers all the time. People plant flowers in their garden. I think the only the only slight issue is, is, is the word, you know, wildflower. To me, a wildflower is, is something that's growing wild naturally. A, a planted flower is a planted flower. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good distinction. And, and the place, the other, the other um, very good explanation out here is, you know, if you're planting flowers, it's a horticultural action. And there's nothing, nothing wrong at all with that. Um, it's, it's when it's, it's sold as a biodiversity action, I think, is the, is the slight issue. The question here, Catherine, on, on the importance of wetlands on farms, uh, which uh, mm. this uh, viewer says is huge, but e even leaving a pond or small springs, low-lying areas to regenerate, streams and not planting wet areas uh, with mm -hmm. trees mm -hmm. to to dry the, it up. Um, would yeah. you, you care to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, totally. And in fact, I think that's one slide I might have been missing after my soil biodiversity. I should have water biodiversity because where you have water there, we now add another whole suite of flora and fauna. Um, and, and, and I omitted that by, by error because it was, but do you know what I mean? That you now have another whole suite added to the others. So you have double bang for your, for your grassy margin along by a watercourse. So I totally agree. And I totally agree. It's not always about trees. So this is why the grassy margins, if you don't want trees or it to turn into scrub, they must be cut, you know, every couple of years. So I think that's important to, to uh, and for the drying out bit, that's re definitely what you'd want to do. So you have a choice which you do, but certainly in wetlands, and I agree with you, the, the only wet corner is the place where people often think I should plant trees. And mm. I agree that should not be planted. Okay, we're, we're coming up uh, on half past 10. Um, I wanted to say a huge thanks to you, Catherine, for today's presentation. Many, many comments uh, or compliments coming through uh, for really engaging presentation uh, so everybody very compliments to you on that uh, and 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 for stepping in at relatively short notice uh, for for Ruth uh, who we will have again yeah. um, and Pat thanks very much for helping with the questions and, and to everybody who submitted questions and joined us today really sincere thanks to you uh, without your questions uh, we wouldn't have that that uh, really rich discussion that we, we have every week so thank you for that uh, and finally, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher, uh, who are our technical support and uh, produce, production team in the background, who are doing all of the organizing and uh, every week. So we, we really do appreciate uh, their help. So uh, until next week, uh, thanks again for, for tuning in. And uh, we do hope you enjoy the weekend. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.